Our next speaker today is Jennifer Mnookin. Uh, she's a professor at the UCLA School of Law, where she's taught since 2005. Her research and writing focuses on the area of evidence, particularly expert and scientific evidence, and the use of forensic science in court. She's written on a wide variety of evidence-related topics, including fingerprint examination and handwriting identification, DNA profiling, documentary films, and the history of expert evidence. I first came across her work in the Yale Journal of Law and Humanities, uh, where she, in 1998, she published a fascinating article that Lewis uh, mentioned in his talk on photographs as evidence in 19th century American courtrooms, and in which she discusses the Mumler case, among many others. And I mean, it's just a masterful uh, piece of writing. This afternoon, she'll be sharing some of her groundbreaking research uh, in her talk titled Constructed Truths, the History of Photography as Legal Evidence. Please welcome Jennifer Mnookin. Thank you, Mia, for that generous introduction. And thanks to Jennifer, too, for doing all of the arrangements for today. I feel like I should also thank Newark Airport for reopening and <laughs> leading several of us to be able to, to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk today about um, photographs as legal evidence. And what's striking, uh, and as we've already seen in several of the talks that we've heard, is how um, this sense of photographs as evidentiary is so, goes so rich and so deeply, especially um, in the 19th century. And the photograph was evidentiary in both the cultural sense and the legal sense. It operated in both registers at once, and they interconnected. Uh, it was seen to furnish evidence. And this idea of the photograph as having a special evidentiary status is really just about as old as the photograph itself. In the well-known New Yorker piece in 1839, uh, the, photograph, the, the author asked, what will become of the poor thieves when they shall be handed in, when, when handed in as evidence against them their own portraits taken by the room in which they stole and in the very act of stealing? This was a fantasy, of course, at the moment of the daguerreotype. Um, I mean, this was absolutely, in one sense, unthinkable, and in another sense, already being thought, right? It was already being imagined that the photograph would provide evidence of a particularly compelling sort and almost in a self-acting way to um, establish criminal goings on. And so it's important, I think, in understanding the history of, of photographic evidence in recognizing this evidential strain that really goes back to the origins of the techniques itself. So with that frame, uh, I want to start by, by with something that's sort of old hat to many in the room, which is the existence of these dueling conceptions for how to understand the photographic image that um, coexisted culturally um, in the late 19th century, although the first was perhaps dominant. So what are these dueling conceptions? First, the one we've already been talking about um, in considerable detail today, um, even if we've been told that it's tired and, uh, well, what else did you tell us, Jordan? The, you had a better word than tired, I can't remember. And geriatric, exactly. Uh, the realist, indexical, mechanically produced notion that this is specially authoritative. And the early history of writings on photography are, is replete with lovely phraseology to capture this notion, right? There's so many examples, and I've given just a few, all of them well known, right? Photograph Oliver Wendell Holmes's wonderful mirror with memory, truth itself in the supremeness of its perfection, the sworn witness of everything presented to her view, and there are dozens of others. This idea, again, note the evidential language, the idea of you know, facticity, testimony, the sworn witness, um, et cetera. But there's another conception that coexists um, that doesn't produce such lovely phraseologies, but that doesn't mean it isn't there. Uh, there were photographers discuss and, and cu cultural commentators talking about the effect of technological processes and choices, the fact that these choices mattered, that photographer control operated at a variety of levels, from choosing, obviously, what to take 
when to take it, and then whether to pose the subjects, to reposition subjects, to make decisions about what's in the frame, what's not in the frame, and then more overt forms of fakery, retouching, altering, combining, all of which, as we've seen and as the, um, as the faking it exhibit shows, go back, um, have a history as old, pretty much as old as photography itself. So we have these dueling cultural notions that are at work uh, as the legal system begins to have to um, take notice of, and the question is, what sort of notice shall it take of, these, for, of this new form of evidence? Why does this matter? Well, one might think that if you buy into the strong evidential paradigm, if you think of it as a, as a mirror with memory, if you think of it as, as I mean, in, to call it indexical would be to be a little anachronistic, but you see the point, then the photograph could and perhaps should have special authority as a kind of evidence, right? It has a heightened form of truthfulness, of authority, better than the mere eyewitness subject to all of the you know, biases and vagaries of human perception and retelling. By contrast, if you think about the photograph more in, within a constructivist paradigm that focuses on the role of the photographer, the limits of the technology, and the potential for manipulation, then not only might these new, the, these new techniques have no inherent special authority, but they might actually have a particularly dangerous potential to mislead, especially considering the circulating first conception. Right? If it's thought to be highly truthful and actually is far more complicated than that, then this could be a particularly dangerous kind of evidence. So this was the puzzle that courts confronted. And courts and legal commentators, we can see traces of both of these understandings in their reception of photographs as evidence. And I chose just one example of each perspective to share with you here. The first is from a case um, in 1882 where the judge says, in admitting the photograph, we cannot conceive of a more impartial and truthful witness than the sun, as its light stamps and seals the similitude of the wound on the photograph put before the jury. It would be more accurate than the memory of witnesses, and is the object of all, sorry, it says of all, evidence is to show the truth. Why should not this dumb witness show it? Right? So this is the photograph as specially authoritative, having um, more, uh, more credibility than a, a, a smart witness. Right? The dumb witness is the category that can be specially believed. By contrast, we see uh, in an article that was first published in a photographic journal but republished in at least four legal journals, uh, a concern that the photograph is actually a dangerous perjurer. And the article goes on to say, can the sun lie is often asked, but much in the same spirit as can the leopard change his spots, a question which is supposed to carry its own answer. Perhaps we may say that though the sun does not lie, the liar may use the sun as a tool. Let all then beware of the liar who lies in the name of truth. So here, the danger is precisely the authority and credibility the photograph may have, um, considering the, the, the high potential to mislead in the hands of a photographer who wishes to uh, stretch the truth. So these were competing conceptions. In a few minutes, I'll tell you how the courts ended up reconciling them. But first, I'll tell you just a tiny bit about how some of the earliest photographs were actually used. Uh, they were sometimes used for identification, sometimes in uncontested ways to show that somebody was who they uh, you know, claimed to be, sometimes in more complicated ways. Ruloff's case was a well-known case from the 1870s where these two gentlemen were found dead. This is actually an engraving taken from a photograph, uh, done, done from a photograph, where um, the photograph was taken when they were first discovered before the bodies decomposed more so that they could later be identified um, effectively. Uh, many of the early cases involving photographs involved images of grants and seals and deeds, uh, and sometimes multiple ones could be juxtaposed together to discuss whether they were forgeries or not. Um, similarly, for fake, um, for handwriting, 
cases involving forged, potentially forged handwriting. There were exemplars put together, photographed, and sometimes enlarged as early as 1859, um, so very early uses. And often exteriors of buildings, locations of landmarks, and so forth. Uh, to understand how photographs were being used in court, um, the technology, what was technologically available, obviously mattered. Um, there's, daguerreotypes were almost never used um, as legal evidence. It wasn't until the 1850s when um, the collodion carrier permitted the rise of paper photographs that we began to see their use in court. But given that the, that, that the production of those images both required skill and had to take place immediately, so either in a studio or with elaborate preparation, that limited um, the potential legal uses. And it wasn't really until um, the emergence of a stable dry plate in the early 1880s that we began to see very widespread use of photographs as legal evidence. So there certainly are numer numerous instances uh, before that. So that's just a, a little sense of some of the ways that, that photographs were used um, prior to the emergence of dry plate uh, technologies. And I wanted to turn also to the Mumler case, though I'm going to go through this, I think, extremely quickly since Lewis has given us um, so much detail. As we've seen, um, he was charged in 1869 with two felonies and a misdemeanor. And the question on the table, it was just a preliminary hearing. Was there sufficient evidence to go forward with this case against him? But it was a preliminary hearing that lasted for days and got a remarkable amount of attention. So it's kind of just interesting to remember that this wasn't actually Mumler on criminal trial. It was Mumler being just a preliminary hearing, and, and yet it got all of this attention. And I think its attention was both about sort of spiritualism and spiritualism on trial, and also the nature of the photograph as this, how these spirit photographs as objects. How could they be understood? Uh, these were evidence of what exactly? Um, Lewis has talked about this a little bit, um, so I'll just say a few words here um, about the multiple ways that these photographs were understood. Uh, we had, as an example of um, as an example of supernatural realism, it's it's believing in the pictures. Photographer William Silver's testimony: I believe the impressions produced are produced by spiritual means. That these pictures must be what they appear to be. So it's the realist impulse, but they're showing something that, of course, wasn't present to the sitter, right? So it's no longer the notion of the photograph capturing what's before the eye, but rather something more than what's before the eye, and yet nonetheless must be because it's shown in the image. And so that's kind of an interesting move. By contrast, the mechanical illusionists don't see it that way at all. Uh, and for some of them, the images themselves simply must be fraud, right? Why aren't they spiritual pictures? Well, two and two make four, right? These can't be spiritual pictures because no such things could exist. Other photographers, as Lewis has detailed, went through elaborate explanations of mechanisms by which these could have been produced. But as I think somebody's question went to, in the, trial, in the preliminary hearing, there was no evidence specifically of how these images were produced. So it was hypothetical. The, the, the experts testifying, the photographers as expert, were telling, essentially offering possibility proofs, right? He could have done it this way. But we can't say for sure he did it any one of these ways because we don't know. Um, but they were showing that there were plenty of mechanical, ordinary mechanisms for producing illusion. Uh, now, the judge didn't think that either side had really proved its case. He didn't think the photographs meant as evidence. That is to say, he didn't think that the photographs themselves could answer the question of how they were produced. Right? They didn't either necessarily mean in the actual existence of the spirits, but nor from the mere fact of their existence could, we, uh, could he conclude that they were fraudulent, and that's why the case was dismissed. But there's two more quick points to make here. One is to see how the photograph here operates as semi-legible, right? It's neither fully comprehensible to a viewer who can definitively say how to read it, nor is it um, epistemically wholly unavailable. It's somewhere in between, 
offering these multiple conceptions that do invite the need for captioning, framing, interpreting, and analyzing. And that's a characteristic of a lot of images that we continue to use in court today, and that we struggle with the relationship between the image and its interpretation, and the question of whether we need special expert authority, a la the photographers in the Mumler case, but this arises now with many kinds of actually uh, of scientific images that we use in court from PET scans and CAT scans or even just x-rays to fingerprints um, and sometimes moving images um, we get uh, w at present in court, we sometimes get experts interpreting photogrammatic grammatography um, and interpreting distance or height from the image itself. We get uh, physicians interpreting the, you know, the, the, the medical image. We also get um, sometimes um, in blurry images, a so-called expert simply telling the viewer what it is that they see. And so this question of semi-legibility and how to understand the image and whether the jury needs special authority continues to arise. And the Mumler case was an interesting early instance of this. A second quick point to make about um, the Mumler case is about what it means to be faking it, the, the wonderful title of the exhibit. The reason Mumler was potentially going to be on trial was not for producing these images that we now look at and think were obviously faked, but because he was claiming that they were something else, right? So the fakery in this context isn't the images itself themselves, but rather what he was saying they were or what he was claiming them to be. If he'd simply been making them as novelties, in one sense, of course, he still would be faking it in that the image would be showing something that had no direct indexical relationship to something that existed in the world. But another, in another sense, he wouldn't have been faking it at all. On the other hand, were these truly spiritual you know, spirits that came down, there would be no faking it, period. So this question about where the fakery is located, in the image itself or only in the relationship between image and claim being made for it is kind of an interesting question, a version, I suppose, of the ordinary question about the relationship between image and caption, image and interpretation, et cetera, that's been you know, widely discussed. But it's got particular purchase in the context of um, an exhibit about the nature of photographic fakery. You know, what sorts of fakery are, in fact, faking it? Is it only faking it when there's a mismatch Match between claim and process, or are artifice techniques, even when they exist on the surface, still a form of faking it in relationship to this other conception of photography? Uh, moving on to back to the 19th century understandings of, of the photograph and, and their, the legal effects of that, um, Miles Orwell has written, I think, quite powerfully about how these two conceptions, the artifice and the realism, actually coexisted. And that's clearly right, right? That the photograph was then, even then, this is not simply a Photoshop uh, constructed image of the world. Even then, the photograph was understood as artificial re realism. The dualism between the indexical version and the artifice is overstated. It was both seen as a potential instrument of illusion and as an especially objective representation of the real, like the well-known doubling where you can see the old woman and the young woman, depending on your perspective. And part of the pleasure of the photograph was its potential to be both at either one or both at once. So part of the pleasure was in going back and forth between seeing the two ideas of the photograph at the same time. That could be a cultural pleasure, but I think not a legal one. Right? Outside of the legal setting, you could play with the idea of was it posed or was it real? Were the pictorialists, um, how much artifice was involved and did it capture a higher truth? But in court, these were anxiety producing questions. So what did the judges end up doing? Throughout the 1870s, they really struggled with this issue, but they eventually settled on a doctrine which did permit the photograph to be used as legal evidence but which downplayed it as having any special or independent or inherent authority. 
And I'm using here Wigmore, who was the great of evidence, as my example. Um, he was a treatise writer, and I'm going to be quoting here from his 1904 treatise. Uh, but he was capturing a view which had become dominant in the courts by the time he was writing. He was not the inventor of this view, though he was a powerful interlocutor of it. What he said was, I'm going to quote him in two, twice here. First, a photograph, like a map or diagram, is merely a witness's pictured expression of the data observed by him, and therein communicated to the tribunal more accurately than by words. So the photograph is like a map or diagram. It's the witness's testimony rendered visually. He says, a map, picture, or diagram is for evidential purposes simply nothing except so far as it has a human being's credit to support it. It is mere waste paper, a testimonial non-entity. It speaks to us no more than a stick or stone. It can of itself tell us no more as to the existence of the thing portrayed upon it than can a tree or ox. We must somehow put a testimonial human being behind it, as it were, before it can be treated as having any testimonial standing in court. It is somebody's testimony or it is nothing. Now, this is a pretty powerful uh, claim, which is also partly wrong, right? It's the legal construction of this evidence, but it doesn't comport with how photographs are widely understood. It is not, for evidential purposes, simply nothing. And note again the conflation map picture or diagram, and he means to include in context photographs within that category. Um, first of all, these are, are, are not all the same themselves, right? The mechanically produced nature of the photograph is invisible within this doctrine. The photograph is assimilated back to these categories of non-mechanically produced images um, as if its um, indexicality, veridical aspect, evidentiary nature doesn't matter for the purposes of legal evidence. So that's, I think, a really interesting move. Moreover, it links the photograph back to the human being. So it says that you can use a photograph, but essentially the human being comes into court and says, I saw this. This captures what I saw. And so here, you too can see that which I'm claiming I saw. And the photograph, at least formally under this doctrine, doesn't then have any more authority than if I could paint that same image in a word picture. Right? It's my testimony rendered visually. So this is formally the method by which photographs come into court. And there's several <coughs> critical aspects to this. First is this analogy, which I've already spoken about, which is um, both, both powerful and not. Right? They, photographs are like maps, models, and diagrams. We, we had a wonderful talk on photo diagrams earlier um, showing the blend of the two. But they both are like them and they're not. And the analogy emphasizes the similarity rather than the differences. And second of all, as we've seen, the photograph gets treated as mere illustration for purposes of evidence. In fact, though, this is a legal fiction. That is to say, the photograph, when it's circulating within evidence, can't actually be limited in the way that Wigmore um, and judges who treat it this way imagine that it might be. There's no question but that once photographs do come in, they are frequently treated by the jury and often by the court as being something more than mere illustration. They're seen to corroborate, not simply to illustrate. If a witness brings in a sketch versus a photograph, those are treated very differently by actual juries. And in some cases, courts permit the jury to infer things from the photograph that went beyond the memory of the witness. Formally, they shouldn't be able to do that, right? If the photograph is simply the, the witness's um, evidence rendered visually, well, then if somebody doesn't remember that street sign, its existence in the image ought not to be taken as evidence. I mean, in a certain way, the image would be truer if we retouched it to remove the parts that the witness no, you know, could, didn't actually know. And yet, that's not what happened. 
So what's very interesting is on the one hand, this is a very sophisticated doctrine, right? It's, a, it's almost a post-Photoshop conception of the photograph, right? That it's only linked back to the human being who testifies that this is what I'm saying happened. Um, and it really, I think, does have an impressive kind of interesting sophistication to it, even though I think in actual fact it was an uneasy legal fiction that, uh, th th that operated with, with complexity. Um, it also produced several doctrinal dilemmas. Um, formally speaking, this doctrine meant that there shouldn't be any problem with using marked images, altered images, recreations, composites, or anything else if the witness was prepared to say, this looks like what I saw. Right? Those should have been acceptable. And yet, they frequently made courts very uneasy. I've used here a Galton image from um, the exhibit. Um, Galton was very interested in composite photographs um, connected to his eugenics theories. He wanted to create criminal types and had notions that by um, you know, taking composites, you could capture the essence. Now, Galton photographs were, to the best of my knowledge, never introduced as evidence. But Persifer Fraser, a handwriting expert, used composite handwriting photographs um, in evidence and was permitted to do so, right? On the notion that by combining 40 of your signatures, you could find the Ur signature and compare it to the one in question. So again, uh, formally under this doctrine, I don't think there would be a problem with composites. Similarly, marked images, altered images, photo diagrams that somebody claimed to reflect that which they saw should have been unproblematic. And same with posed or recreated crime scene images. There began to be, um, even in the 1890s, uh, admissibility disputes about posed images and reproductions. Um, formally, they should have been admitted. There's no question that under this doctrine, the witness is saying, this is what I say happened, let me show you. And yet, some courts couldn't go that far. Uh, to give just one example, um, in 1898, a judge re rejected a, um, a, a, po a posed photo of the, a series of posed photos of a crime scene, saying, and I quote, they were not simply reproductions of the scene of the homicide. They were photographic representations of tableau vivant, carefully arranged by the chief witness, whereby his version of the tragical occurrence should be brought vividly before the mind's eye of the jury. Their effect, if not their purpose, was by photographic processes to strengthen and bring out in striking, captivating fashion his version. And the court said that was unacceptable. And you can understand why a court was uneasy about this if they thought that these images were going to be understood in what Miles said earlier, he talked about the spirit of actuality. If these reconstructions were going to be understood in that spirit, they were dangerous indeed. And yet, formally, those proffering such evidence were acknowledging that they were posed recreations. So this, I think, illustrates something interesting about our ambivalence about whether pointing out the constructedness of these images undoes their power or not. And I think that actually remains a very live question because it strikes me that even now, um, we simultaneously have a very visually savvy public culture where everybody can see the binders full of women and know that they're, you know, that they're, they're produced. And yet we have big zones of credulity, credulity where um, within those zones, we tend to see the image as partaking in the spirit of actuality, even as another part of our brain knows that they might not be. Um, and so I, I think we, we, we continue to wrestle with those questions. These come up, these issues come up today um, in a wide range of cases, including um, filmed confessions, where the, 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 on the one hand, these are viewed as um, important limitations on police power, because by filming the confession, they can't later make different claims about what happened. And yet what these are, are the defendant playing himself and performing himself in a recreation that may have its own um, complex visual and interpretive dynamics. So what are the consequences of this analogy? Um, I'll name just a couple. Obviously, it meant that formally, photographs didn't have any special authority as representations in court. 
they were treated just like any other visual, visual image that might be used, including hand-drawn drawings, models, maps, and diagrams. It also meant that the photographer, him or herself, usually himself, didn't have to testify that anyone could be the testimonial sponsor. Right? The claim was, this is what I saw, not this is what I made. In some of the earliest cases involving photography, the photographer was required to be there um, to say, you know, I didn't manipulate. But once you had this alternative doctrinal path for admissibility, it doesn't need to be the photographer. It can be anybody. And in theory, as I mentioned, you shouldn't be able to use the photograph as proof going beyond the witness's recollection, although there are, in fact, numerous cases that permit that. Mm -hmm. It also uh, had a series of other consequences. I argue that it helped create a culture of construction in the courtroom more generally. Because it turns out that maps, models, and diagrams actually had rather limited use in the courtroom prior to the advent of the photograph. They were used in some kinds of cases, but not that often. They were rarely disputed, and they weren't thought about much. Land disputes involved maps, no question. Patent disputes involved images. They existed, but within relatively defined categories. When judges created this analogy to the photograph, it reinvigorated the whole category, and lawyers began not only using photographs, but thinking more about how to use other kinds of visual representations. And so it really, I believe, transformed visual proof more generally, and even the frame by which lawyers thought about evidence. Evidence became more explicitly something not simply to be found, but made. Evidence began to be more thought of um, as something that could be constructed. Uh, just a couple of other final concluding remarks here. Uh, I do think that these issues continue to um, get to us today, that, we ha we, that in the courtroom and outside of it, we don't yet have answers. Um, later, courts did create a silent witness alternative theory for admitting photographs in circumstances where you had no testimonial sponsor. And that's come under some pressure in this age of Photoshop. But these multiple theories do continue to coexist awkwardly. And today, we both see courts continuing to use the illustrative theory and using it now for an enormous variety of visual representations that go well beyond photographs. So animations and simulations are frequently admitted into court under the theory that they are illustrations mm -hmm. of the testimonial sponsor. Um, at the same time, we also see struggles with these questions about semi-legibility that I've just referred to um, earlier in the context of the Mumler case. If we permit an expert interpreter, how do we regulate or validate their expertise? How do we know whether they might be faking it? How do we know who to trust and how to trust for images that don't seem to speak directly to the fact finder? Finally, I think it's interesting to um, connect this set of stories to debates about the understanding of photography and objectivity on, in science as well as law. And I found myself thinking as I was preparing for today of a book that some of you may know called The Objectivity by Lorraine Dastin and Peter Gallison where they try to create a, a historical narrative of the production of scientific objectivity. They have three modes. One, truth to nature, which was really atlas drawing, where the scientist made nature most truthful by creating an idealized type that wasn't like any specific specimen. That's almost exactly like the composite conception we saw here. The middle category for them is mechanical objectivity, which they tie quite closely to the advent of photography, where it's a particularizing move, where it's the, the objectivity claim comes from the particularized, individualized, unmediated nature of the representation. And that they associate with the late 19th and early 20th century. And then they create a final period of what they call trained judgment, where it's no longer mechanical objectivity, but rather the expert's interpretation of that which is produced through relatively unmediated processes. And what I think is striking when we think about their categories in relationship to the use of photographic evidence and photography more generally is that the periodicity, I think, starts to fall apart. That is to say, I think we see now 
elements of all three of these modes in how we treat evidence in court. Um, that we do still think of photographs as partaking of mechanical objectivity, but we permit the truth to nature conception um, on some occasions, and perhaps even more often, with semi-legible images in particular, the presence of trained judgment. And all three of these modes create disparate possibilities for both authenticity, evidence, truth, but also different mechanisms by which interlocutors and images may both be faking it. Thank you. actually still the illustrative theory. The dominant theory for admitting them is still that you have a testimonial sponsor, and it represents that which the sponsor claims. But there is this other silent witness theory that can have the photograph speak for itself if it was produced in circumstances that lead us to have confidence in it. So for example, surveillance cameras or other um, other kinds of images where you can't have a testimonial sponsor, the whole point is that nobody saw it, uh, invited courts to create this alternative pathway. So these two theories coexist, and judges use them relatively opportunistically when they need to. Um, but the silent witness theory has a much bigger problem if somebody challenges the chain of custody or authentication or whatnot of the image. Whereas under the testimonial theory, um, the court can still admit it for what it's worth, as long as you say it's what you saw. And the testimonial sponsor doesn't need to be the photographer. Does not need to be the photographer. I mean, frequently in court, you know, somebody will bring a picture of, of you know, something that, that they might have been the photographer, but they might not. They might say, this captures. In fact, sometimes they could be handed in court, does this accurately represent that which you saw? Yes, it does. OK, now I'll mark it and admit it to the jury. Now, it's not quite clear why we then let those images, and some courts do, go to the jury room and be poured over by the jury when they're supposed to be admitted only on this testimonial sponsorship theory. But those are the kind of uneasy paradoxes of the doctrine that we really haven't yet resolved. Um, I just wanted how video is treated. Um, the, when courts first began admitting filmic evidence, they largely did it by analogy to the photograph. So they treated the photograph as if it were anal analogically continuous with the map model and diagram, and they treated the filmic image as if it were analogically uh, a continuation of the photograph. So there's a bunch of early film cases where they talk about films as merely a series of still photographs moving over time. Um, there was some unease about that, too, for the differences between film and photographs. But largely, they, film, film also is treated as simply needing authentication by a testimonial sponsor um, to be uh, permitted. I loved your uh, opening quotation, and I just wanted to add um, what you surely know, but um, just add to, to the room the uh, commentary that Talbot puts with uh, Articles of China, where he says, in little more time than it would take to make a written inventory of a uh, collector's uh, group of China pieces, uh, one could photograph them. Um, and the more complex they are, the, the more useful it would be. And should a thief then purloin one of the objects and this were presented in court, what a novel piece of evidence that would be. That's right. Um, so I, I like him thinking about that already in that, 1844. Yeah, that's another wonderful example. That's exactly right. Thank you for that. It seems to me with uh, video evidence, which has a date and time stamp, that you eliminate possibly some of the questions about the um, truthfulness of the image. Uh, I, I think you have to get an expert, I assume, in to testify in some way that the date and stamp system is accurate and 
has not been manipulated, but I imagine that uh, you know the, all these video cameras that we have all over the city now would make it a little bit easier for prosecutors. So. I think yes and no is the answer. First of all, with the early filmic evidence, they didn't have any kind of date and time stamp system, right? So that wasn't available when filmic evidence first began to be used. Um, what is true is that this alternative approach to admissibility, which I referenced in with respect to the sur surveillance cameras, actually has a longer history and can be used for video evidence as well in some circumstances, which is essentially authentication by process rather than by person. I actually think it has its origins in the x-ray when um, Rentgen rays first became um, a form of evidence, you no longer could have a testimonial sponsor in the same kind of way because there was no person who could say they'd seen it. That was the whole point of the x-ray, right? It was showing us images of things unseen. And so courts developed a process-based theory where they said the mechanical process was working as it was supposed to. The uh, expert, and in this case they did require an expert, either the technician or the, or the, or the doctor, uh, to say that it was working as it was supposed to, and they used the process as this alternative method. And that process-based theory is part of what got developed for silent witness camp photographic evidence and eventually for some kinds of filmic evidence as well. Of course, you know, in some instances these become battles of the experts. Right, where when there's actually a claim of manipulation or fraud or fakery, the court does have to make a preliminary determination about whether there's sufficient evidence of authenticity to permit it to go to the jury. But time and date stamping could be one aspect of helping to authenticate a process-based pro approach to admissibility. Two things that, that you didn't touch on, but I'd be interested in hearing a little bit about. One is that I know that within the evidentiary production system, meaning specifically police, detective, forensic photographers, etc., their processes became more systematized and even their instruments became systematized. I know there were cameras, for example, developed specifically for recording car accidents in order to, so you could, you could on a grid, show how, uh, how far the skid marks had gone and where the debris occurred and so forth and so on. Uh, I'm wondering to what extent that may be uh, ritualized and, 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 and simplified some of these testimonial uh, sponsorship processes. Oh. But the, the second question is that most of what uh, you've been talking about, as I understand it, is case law and not legislation. And I wonder if you would talk a little bit about the absence of any legislation regarding the authenticity of photographs in the judicial system. So those are both really interesting questions. On the first, I, I guess I would say that the um, techniques and improvements developed by forensic photographers were more done for purposes of both investigation and authority production in court than for admissibility. That is to say, they were innovating in ways that helped them better investigate a case and figure things out, and also perhaps better to sell the authority of their images to the jury rather than as necessary steps to get their images before the jury in the first place. And so I've been focusing more on the admissibility piece than on the persuasion piece, so there's interesting intersections. But they didn't, they, they didn't and still don't need to use any of those techniques in order to make their image merely admissible, right? It's been a pretty low hurdle, which isn't to say that you might not have more success with a jury to, um, sci you know, to, to scient scientifize your ability to talk about the image. There's an enormous tension in courts about experts more generally and whether we expect juries to defer to their authority and expertise or whether our model is that the experts are educating the jury. And um, experts routinely engage in a double dynamic of trying to quasi-educate the jury and produce deference to their own authority. And technique and process is a, f a relatively frequent method for doing that. So I, I don't have a, I, I haven't looked into this into enough detail to have a strong causal story there, but I think that the two drivers there are more investigative power and persuasion than admissibility. 
On the legislative point, it's an interesting one. I'd like to think more about it. I guess evidence in general has been relatively unregulated by the legislature beyond passing federal rules of evidence, which tend to be relatively generalized. There are exceptions. I mean, there are legislatures, there are some DNA specific things, there have been paternity tests. I mean, so there are instances in which courts, in, in which legislatures have engaged in more particularized um, evidence assessments. But evidence is, it's such, it is a kind of resolutely common law area that's now been partly codified through rules in most states. But those rules tend to operate at levels of generality that talk about you know, balancing prejudice and probative value, or telling you what to do with hearsay, or requiring authentication and giving a set of methods for how. There, there have been some talks about some statutory stuff around e-discovery. So it, it's an interesting question, and I should think more about that. Professor, I'm a dentist and I often work as an expert witness in dental malpractice matters. Historically, we've always used film uh, radiographs as, as, as evidence, hard evidence. And now with the advent of digital imaging, I'm wondering if there's any precedent that you're aware of that has been set where these digital images that have been taken as a result of a, ch a break in the chain of, uh, of evidence have been altered or changed in some way to favor one side uh, to, to persuade a particular outcome. I'm just wondering if you're aware of anything. Um, I don't know of any involving um, dentistry in particular. There are cases in which there have been claims of alteration um, around digital images more generally. Your, your question also, though, reminds me of the relationship between um, sort of digital images and enhancement. Because there's also forensic fields. I don't know whether you guys do this in dentistry. But for example, fingerprint examiners frequently digitally enhance their images to make what's there clearer. So this is operating in the register of locating what's already there and making it more visible than the image itself did. But it's also, of course, a form of manipulation and alteration and arguably faking it. And courts have tr have largely punted there. That is, they've they've again thanks in part to the testimonial sponsor theory, they've permitted some degree of enhancement without asking too many questions about is the enhancement uncovering that which is ontologically real or might it not be creating something through the process of enhancement. So I think that raises sort of parallel questions and that comes up actually quite a lot in cases involving certain forensic techniques. Uh, if you do any um, forensic odontology, we, we can talk later because I'm a skeptic, but we'll, we'll discuss, <laughs> right? So. Are privately owned surveillance cameras treated differently from, say, state-owned surveillance cameras? Um, again, for admissibility purposes, no, right? For admissibility purposes, you have to show that it's adequately authenticated. What that means is that you're going to have to show either that the process was working properly at the time or you know, something of that sort. For persuasion purposes, quite possibly. But at a formal doctrinal level, um, the courts have not in the, been in the business of making that distinction as a fulcrum that, um, that, that answers questions of admissibility. Good question. Thank you so much. All right, thanks to all of you.